this picture here is mostly, it's a portion of the interactive 3.8 gigapixel image that I took, which has been seen by 1.3 million people. And um, we only printed a portion of it here. We could have printed it 50, 60 feet wide, but this just shows the extent of base camp in, in the spring of 2012. Now over here we have something that's very exciting. With that camera array and Microsoft, we have created a system that's far superior to any other uh, type of aerial photography in the world in that we can start here with Choi Yu and Gaia Chin Kong and start flying. This is not a movie. This is done with still photographs taken every three seconds. So once we get here up to Everest, and look what we can do. Watch this. We can go in and we can examine the glaciers and how they're changing. And so we go back to here, and we can keep flying all the way up. Uh, and there's the south pole of Everest at 26,000 feet. Close this, we can zoom in, we can even see the remnants of the camp at 8,000 meters here, leftover uh, tents on the top of Everest. This is how we start a glacier works, which is, we have to show the before and after. And the before, the early shots were always from early explorers. This was the British expedition in 1921 took the first pictures on the north side of Everest. So here's the glacier in 1921. Here it is in 2008. It's just, it's uh, incredible, uh, the rate, the, uh, the melt rate. Some of it's natural, some of it's caused by warming, but if I was to draw you a graph, and I'm not supposed to touch the photos, then the melt rate has been like this, but it's going to go like that. I've been climbing here 33 years, and these are uh, what I decided is to use my photographic and climbing skills to um, contribute to showing the effects of climate change in the Himalayan region. So we had to start and show people we could do it, and and um, you know, no one could understand when I wanted to fly that camera array in that helicopter, that you would end up with something like that. This is nearly impossible to get funding for it. So, but once people start, once we got the iconic things done, this is the low-hanging fruit. You know, now we want to go to Mustang, Dolpo, Umla, and even if there's no glaciers, just to document the landscape from a great vantage point, clear GPS point, and say, here it is available on Glacier Works. You want to go there 10 years later and see if the forests have, you know, grown or shrunk, or if the, if there's more landslides. Or, you, you know, you know what we are. Our our hope are, is that when uh, students and teachers or even citizens come in here, they they leave learning more about their world, even their own country, than they knew before that some will be inspired to pursue uh, education that um, leads them to be able to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And a lot of, all of this here is understood by science. And the scientists come up with the, uh, the information and the models and, and the, that policymakers can use to come up with solutions. So, and, and, and even if just some 11-year-old boy or girl walks in here and says, wow, look what I now know about my country, and they don't do anything but have that in their head. Because sometimes it comes out in a way you never know, right? We all know that. I became a climber because I saw a picture of Tenzing on the summit of Everest when I was 11. And so that one image, 
and the fascination with the Himalayas led directly to me being here with this exhibit. Thank you so much. You're welcome.